Well, thank you very much for staying with us. This is Ebru Primetime News on this 25th day of December 2019. Only five days before we say goodbye to the year 2019. So I trust that the year has been good to you so far. My name is Unilu Bembe. Welcome to the program. Now Kenyans thronged Uhuru Park on Christmas Day, that is today, to celebrate with their families and loved ones. They were treated to various forms of entertainment. However, most of them did not travel up country in what they say is due to the tough economic times. Take a look. As Kenyans continue celebrating Christmas, Nairobians flocked Uhuru Park grounds today. The old and young were all in Mary. Businesses were up in hands, baby toys were all over, games thus being a fun moment to all. Most of the Kenyans expressing their joy. At least we are having fun. Tumedeta watoto huku wafurahie. Kwa sababu we live once and it is good to have fun. At Rupert there are people, but in town there are no people. Christmas iko tu sawa, e, tunajienjoy itu, tunajibamba. Christmas imeanza vizuri, jua imewaka, weather iko sawa. However, some did not travel up country. This they said was due to harsh economic times. Chumi imeenda mbaya zana, siyo venye tuliko tunatarajia. Bengi metu watu jaenda reserve ya pesa. A few of the Kenyans we spoke to complained that ever since the new currency was introduced in the market, there has been scarcity of cash. Businessmen and women who set up their businesses at Uhuru Park lamented that this year their businesses have been affected by the poor economy compared to the past years. Christmas. last year. So difference kuna difference imeenda chini Christmas ni mzuri lakini maisha ndio imekuwa juu sana maisha ni mbaya sana sio kama hizo Christmas ingine tuna enjoy vizuri tumeje tulianza jana kulikuwa ngumu hakuna pesa ji kama watu wameenda nyumbani wote na naona watoto wamejaa hapa leo hata tujui tutafanyaje Jerry Jogu for TV and away from Huru Park and elsewhere, merry and happiness. This is what mothers at the Pumwani Hospital received as they cuddled their newborns on Christmas Day. Among the deliveries were one set of triplets and another set of twins with a number totaling to 20. When Jiromaina visited the facility and files the following story. Joy and more joy is what the faces of these mothers portray. 75 birds on 24th of December, 55 normal and 20 caesarean deliveries. On the eve of Christmas Day and until 6.30 a.m., 20 healthy babies were received with one set of triplets and another set of twins. According to the hospital's covering nurse, Nasir bin Isak, 20 babies were born with no cases of steel birds. For the eve of Christmas, let me say, as the evening started yesterday, came in up to now, up to 6.30 in the morning, we had a total delivery of, of 20, 20 mothers were delivered. Out of the special thing about, we had one triplet and we had two twins. He observed that the facility recorded an increase of mothers delivering compared to last year during the same period. The figures have tripled. So by maybe last uh, Christmas Eve was 20 or 15, but this now we can see uh, on that from 6, 7.30 to 6, 6 in the morning, we had 20. When you get the 24 hours, we had 75. So the numbers are growing. In Ward 4, new mothers could not hide their joy. One mother delivered a set of twins and another triplets. Others received their bundle of joy, with some saying they had not quite expected to deliver on Christmas Day. Mm. 
na nimejifungua kijana. Nasikia raha sana. Tu niko na mtoto mmoja na sasa hii niko nimebarikiwa na watoto wa tatu. Sasa niko na waile. Mimi ujiza sana hata mimi nasangai nimetoka wapi? Ni kwa familia yetu hakuna. Nimejifungua saa sita. Na sija, vile nimejifungua sijapata shida yoyote. Na nashukuru Mola hata mtoto nimemuita Precious Fever. With the government's assurance of improving health care, mothers in the facility said that the move is a big boost to the health sector, as well as giving mother and child better care through NHIF and Linda Mama initiatives. It's good. Nimefurahia juu sijapata wakunitisha chochote na nafurahia services zake because venyata sasa nangoja kulilisiwa. Sijapata nikono wametupa government imetupa lida mama tuko na HMF so it's catering for everything with some women in the rural areas still practicing traditional ways of giving birth the newborn mothers had this to advice naambia wakiwa wakiwa wajawazito wakuwa kienda clinic alafu wachukue hii kadi ya linda mama itawasaidia Christmas seasons come and go, but some moments can never be forgotten. As Kenyans celebrate the Christmas festivities, mothers here at the Pumwani Hospital could not hide their happiness as they received their bundles of joy on the eve of Christmas Day. They say that the move by the government to bring about free maternal services has greatly encouraged them, thus reducing maternal deaths. From us here at the Pumwani Hospital, we wish you a merry, merry Christmas. Reporting for Ebru TV, I'm Wanjiro Maina. All right, thank you very much, Wanjiro Maina. And of course, visiting Pumwani Maternity Hospital. I hope that you're getting baby fever for now because those babies are really, really cute. And of course, major congratulations to all the mothers as well. Now, from Pumwani Maternity Hospital to all the way to Mombasa, and President Uhuru Kenyatta, his predecessor, Mwai Kibaki, Deputy President William Ruto, and opposition leader, Raila Odinga, are among prominent politicians who have sent Christmas messages to Kenyans, urging them to share with the less fortunate in the society, President Uhuru Kenyatta sent his Christmas wishes during a mass service at St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church in Nyali, Mombasa County. Kuatakia kila moja wenu na familia zenu na wa Kenya wote. Merry Christmas and a very happy and prosperous 2020. This was the president's Christmas message to Kenyans after attending Christmas Eve Mass at the St. Francis of Assis Catholic Church in Nyali, Mombasa County. <laughs> President Uhuru Kenyatta, father in his message, called upon Kenyans to live together in peace and harmony in order to develop a prosperous nation. He also thanked the church for their prominent role in the push for national unity and in the fight against corruption. Kumshukuru sana babo parokia na viongozi wetu wa kanisa letu kwa mwito ambao wamechukua uweo menyewe na kusema ya kwamba wataongoza kama wa katoliki kama wa kristiano kama wa kenya na mwito wetu wa kuweka wa kenya pamoja tuishi pamoja kwa amani he was accompanied by first lady margaret kenyatta and other members of the first family the president and his family are currently on holiday in the coastal town of mombasa Meanwhile, Deputy President William Ruto also sent a message of goodwill to Kenyans and urged Kenyans to remember those who do not have as much as they do and do drive safely and obey traffic rules. Other prominent leaders who sent their Christmas messages through their different Twitter handles include former President Mike Baki, opposition leader Rilo Dinger, and seat leader Musalia Mudavadi, amongst others. Mili Kisenya, Fuebru TV.
All right, now still on Christmas matters, Inspector General of Police Hilary Mutiambai has assured Kenyans of total security during the festive season as he pledged to have regular police patrols countrywide. Mutiambai says an adequate number of officers have been deployed across the country to ensure criminals do not take advantage of the festive season to rob holiday makers. Now, the Inspector General of Police says many officers have been sent to the coastal region where most local and international tourists are most are more likely to tour. Mutiambai has further said all police constables who have been in office for over 30 years will be promoted in 2020. According to Mutiambai, his office is finalizing on the promotion documents for the process to begin in January next year. Officers targeted for promotion are those with reputable records. <music> And away from Christmas celebrations and all the merrymaking to some really sad news. And a middle-aged woman was this morning electrocuted to death in Lainisaba in Kibra slums in Nairobi. The woman is said to have met her untimely death when she went to take a shower in a general service bathroom at Amref area. Elsewhere, two people died on the spot after their car rammed a stalled tanker at the southern bypass within Langata in Nairobi. Several people have also been injured following an accident along Mombasa Road involving two personal cars and Machakos bound Bas Kindo of Stefano tells us more on this tragic story. Several passengers have been rushed to Sharom Hospital in Machakos after sustaining injuries from a morning accident between a Machakos bound bus and two personal cars. The bus, whose details remain unknown, was heading to Machakos before it hit one of the cars that had stalled along the road following another accident. <laughs> The wreckage of the Machakos bound bus was, however, later moved away. Investigations into what caused the accident is still ongoing. Two people on Wednesday morning died on the spot after their car rammed a stalled tanker on Southern Bypass in Langata. Langata sub county commander Gregory Mutiso said the two young men could have been driving at an alarming speed when they hit the stationary tanker from behind. According to witnesses, the duo was allegedly drunk driving. The bodies of the deceased have since been transferred to city morgue even as police caution against overspeeding during this festive season. A middle-aged woman was on Wednesday morning electrocuted to death in Lainisaba, Kibra slums in Nairobi. Neighbors to the deceased say she was in a jolly mood and was looking forward to Christmas celebrations. Confirming the incident, Kibra AP boss Andrew Musaisi said Kenya power officials have since been informed to go and disconnect the power line to enable the retrieval of the body from the scene. The accident occurred just a day after man and his wife are among five people who died on Tuesday morning following an accident at Mwiwondwe Bridge on the Ekero Boyangu Road. Five other people, including children, were seriously injured during the accident that occurred when the vehicle they were traveling in rolled on the bridge. Reporting for Ebro TV, I'm Kaindo Stefano. All right, and of course, our hearts and prayers to the family who've lost their loved ones. And of course, may they rest in eternal peace. Now let's cross over to Kisumu, where as Kenyans celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, there was nothing merry about this Christmas for patients in public health facilities in Kisumu County after talks to end doctor's strike, which enters day 18 today, collapsed. Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union, that is KMPDU officials, and Kisumu Health CEC, Professor Miguda Atiang failed to reach a consensus after over eight hours of meeting. KMPDU Nyanza Chairman Dr. Kevin Osuri, who led the talks on behalf of the doctors, says the meeting ended in a stalemate and no agreement was reached. According to Dr. Osuri, the strike will continue until their demands are met, adding that the thorny issue of promotions has not been addressed. The Nyanza KMPDU boss says, and I quote, We're telling you that the doctors of Kisumu County will not be on duty. We are on strike. We are asking members of the public to please seek health services in private facilities or move to other neighboring counties. End of quote.
He said the county has not promoted senior consultants who are the most affected by the promotion clause and a number of doctors have also not been promoted to the correct job groups as per the return to work formula. The county allegedly requested for time until February to promote all doctors but the union says it has been treated to lip service and will not tolerate it anymore. At the moment, Kisi and Siaya have been commended for promoting all doctors as per collective bargaining agreement. On Monday, the County Executive Committee member for Health, Professor Judith Atiang, convened a press conference where she said those who will fail to pick their letters by close of Monday should consider themselves sacked. The doctors through KMPDU rejected the county government's offer, which they termed a mockery and an insult to their professions, insisting that the county government drew the promotion letters to wrong and illegal job groups, placing doctors in lower and junior job groups with unacceptable loss of career years. The strike, which enters its 18th day today, has left Kisumu residents at the mercy of private hospitals as the stalemate between the doctors and the county government persists. Meanwhile, nurses in the county have given the county government a strike notice as their return to work agreement expires on December 31st. Mini Lubembe for Ebru TV. An magistrate has ordered Mathari Mental Hospital to produce a woman facing multiple fraud charges over fake procurement of laptops linked to State House and other government departments. Kembu Senate uh, Senior Principal Magistrate Stella Atambo issued the orders after the accused Joy Wangari Kamau, alias Patricia Mereka, failed to appear in court. Now, Wangari has been at Mathari for psychiatric assessment and the hospital is also expected to report her mental condition to determine whether she is fit to plead to the consolidated fraud charges against her. The hospital's representative, Dr. Nganga, tabled a medical report indicating she was not fit to stand trial. Wangari is accused of defrauding Charles Nganga of 40 million shillings and another 96 million shillings in separate places by claiming she was in a position to award him a tender to supply a military surveillance system. She faces other counts of falsely presenting herself as a state house employee. Wangari is also accused of conspiring to steal 120 HP laptops valued at 96 million shillings from the same complainant by means of fake tender. A sample has directed that she be produced on December 11. Now, to some events that took place in the year 2019, talk of power, struggle, and activism. That will be the perfect depiction of how Kenya's judici judiciary conducted itself in 2019. The third arm of government flexed its muscle in giving out decisions that continue to shape Kenya's landscape. The uh, David Maraga-led institution, as Kenneth Kazungu now tells us, faced resistance from the first arm of government amid claims of arm twisting. Take a look. The corridors of justice took off to a busy 2019. The wheels of justice this year started grinding right here at the Supreme Court, where the David Moraga-led division closed the chapter on the 2017 election petitions. Top on the list being Embu Governors Martin Wambora and Nyambira's John Nyangaramas, whose election petitions were dismissed. The petition of appeal dated 7 September 2018 is hereby dismissed. The judges on January 30th ruled that Nyangarama was validly elected and that Wambora's rival, Leni Kivuti, did not raise issues on the interpretation or application of the Constitution in his petition. For the avoidance of doubt, the declaration of the, of the results of the election of the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission in respect of the Governor for Embu County is hereby upheld. Kabuchai MP James Mukwe also retained his seat after the Apex Court overturned nullification of his election by the Appeals Court. Now that was not the end of election petitions at the highest court in the land as many more rulings were made later on in the year which we'll be getting back to in a moment. But it was a hilly 2019 
for the Mili Mani locals right here, as these corridors of justice made decisions that got a lot of attention, both home and abroad. The first case that put Kenya on the global map happened on May 24th, when a three-judge bench made up of justices Chacha Mwita, Rosaline Aburili, and John Mativo unanimously upheld the ban on same-sex relations. We find that the impugned sections are not unconstitutional. Accordingly, the consolidated petitions have no merit. We hereby decline the relief sought and dismiss the consolidated petition. A decision that drew strong criticism from the United Nations and various rights activists. I'm really ashamed to see that this is how the courts have decided. However, we still continue to believe in the rule of law and we are going to appeal this decision. So we try to make it clear that in interpreting the Kenyan constitution, they should be interpreting our law based on how Kenyans intended that law to be interpreted. Another matter that opened Kenya to the globe was the determination on June 19th when the High Court found three men guilty of aiding and abating Al-Shabaab fighters who carried out the Garissa University attack that killed 148 people, mostly students, four years ago. I'm satisfied that the incident that took place at the Garissa University College on the morning of 2nd April 2015 bore all the above elements of a terrorist act. Justice Francis and I said the three Kenyans, Mohammed Ali Abikar, Hassan Aden Hassan, and Rashid Charles Merecero, a Tanzanian, were members of the Al-Shabaab terrorist group whose members carried out the attack. The first and second accused persons did so through the communications on the mobile phone, while the accused person, the fifth accused person, has been shown to have been in company of the attackers by his presence at the scene and by his conduct. And as such, they were all slapped with life sentences. In total, therefore, the first and second accused person will serve 41 years imprisonment each. The decision in that case was not all gloom and doom. And in as much as it was filled with tension and sadness, there was this moment. The fourth accused person, Sahal Diri, also known as Sahali Diri Hussein, was let off the hook after the prosecution failed to link him to the attack. What caught the attention of many, however, is that Sahali could be seen engaging what seemed to be long prayers, with many arguing that they could have led to his acquittal. <laughs> now, the anti-corruption division of the High Court is housed here, at the Mali Mani Law Courts, where this 2019 was a beehive of activities, as the anti-graft trio of DPP Nordin Haji, DCI boss George Kinoti and EACC chief Twali Bumbarak became the greatest nightmare to officials whose hands were caught in the cookie jar. The first county chief to be dragged through the corridors of the David Maraga-led arm of government was Moses Kasaine Lenol Kulal, governor of Samburu County, who was charged with corruption, economic crimes and misappropriation of about 84 million Kenya shillings. It is here that the courts flexed its judicial muscle and slapped Lenol Kulal with the record 100 million shillings bail. Accused one shall be released on a bond of Kenya shillings 150 million with one surety of similar amount or a cash bail of Kenya shillings 100 million. It was since reduced to 10 million. This was followed by the subsequent arraignments of Kiambu Governor Ferdinand Waititu and his Nairobi counterpart Mike Sonko who was lumped with punitive bail terms. After having considered all the material placed before me, I'm, the, I'm of the considered opinion that all accused are hereby admitted to bail, to bail terms. These bail terms must be adhered to, to the letter. Any violation shall lead to cancellation of the bail terms. Other senior government officials to feel the weight of the scales of justice include suspended Treasury CS Henry Rotich and his peers, Kamau Thuge, who are alleged to have taken a sip from the dreaded Aror and Kimorer Dams funds. All right, and that's not all that happened in the corridors of justice in the year 2019. We need to take a first commercial break, but when we come back, we still have a part two of the events that took place in the corridors of, uh, corridors of justice. Stay with us. 
All right, welcome back. Glad you're still with us. And of course, this is Ebru TV Prime Time News. And of course, we're continuing with the second part of the events that happened at the corridors of justice. And of course, which faced a lot of resistance from the first arm of government. And of course, amid claims of arm twisting. Here is the second part of what happened in the corridors of justice. Now, apart from its primary role, that is the dispensation of justice, in 2019, Kenya's third arm of government found itself in unprecedented times, a near personal chief with the executive over claims of arm twisting. It all played out here. I'm told <laughs> that some CSS and the PSS are bragging that uh, the, the CJ will or should be removed before the end of this year. Really? An agitated C.J. Maraga accusing the executive of mistreatment and not taking the judiciary seriously. You, <laughs> you read uh, recently attempts to withdraw police traffic clearance for the C.J. That's how the C.J. is treated. A clerk is the one who addresses the C.J. So angry was Maraga that he made good his threat to boycott the 56th Jamhuri Day celebrations at the Nyayo Stadium, much to the chiding of the executive. I call on the judiciary. <laughs> if they so desire. Back to the gubernatorial decisions, and in as most of the petitions were dismissed except a few, the decision of the apex court seemed not to have gone down too well. With the petitioner in the Kirinyaga gubernatorial race, now Kenya party leader Martha Karua, who now threatens to find justice beyond the Supreme Court. I'm fighting this suit because of wrongs committed to me by the judicial arm of government, arising from the decision of the Supreme Court on the 7th of August, when it dismissed my election petition appeal on the grounds that it was time barred through no fault of my own. In other words, the Supreme Court of Kenya served me with injustice instead of justice. The decisions that came out of the Court of Appeal in 2019 were not appealing to many. The highlight moment in this median court being this decision. Having found as we have that, that the bail terms did not offend Article 181 or Section 6226, we also observed that no other reasons were advanced to demonstrate that the bail conditions imposed were unconstitutional and reasonable or unattainable. In the decision which now sinks county chiefs even deeper into doom, the appellate court argued that the decision to bar the governor is a constructive measure and does not amount to removal from office. And contrary to the appellant's assertion that the learned judge introduced new arguments, both courts below acceded to the dictates of Article 10.1b of the Constitution and took into account the imperatives of ch Chapter 6 of the Constitution on leadership, on leadership and integrity and other public interest elements of the Constitution. What an eventful year it has been at Kenya's corridors of justice. But even as the third arm retreats for the December holidays. Uh, so we are happy. So those, those who are asking for convictions, this is one, one of it and more to come next year. But um, I assure you, <laughs> all governors are on the radar. <laughs> and and uh, if they engage in crime, um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are going to get to them very soon. A full entry awaits them with more decisions expected. That could change the course of this country. Right, thank you very much, Ken Kazungo, for that. Well, put peace on the events that happened in the corridors of justice. Now all the way to West Pocot, and the Chinese government has donated 10 million shillings to help landslide and flood victims in West Pocot County to construct new houses where more than a thousand people are still living in Nyarkulian, Tamkal and Parua camps one month down the line after their houses were buried by landslides in November. They are facing a bleak Christmas as they have nothing to celebrate about after losing everything. 
A check of 10 million, which was presented to the area governor John Lunyangapu by Devolution Cabinet Secretary Eugene Wamalwa, as a Christmas gift to the victims, will be used to buy construction materials for the houses. Speaking at governor's residence after delivering the check, CS Wamalwa says the government will start erecting the houses in January. So today I come home uh, bearing a Christmas gift from the Red Cross Society of China and uh, through the Chinese Embassy we did receive 10 million that we were requested to bring to the people of West Pokot to assist those families that were affected during the landslide to be able to rebuild their homes to be able to rebuild their lives and to be able to uh, carry on even after uh, this disaster he noted that this Christmas season might not be a merry for many families in the county after they lost their family members following the floods that worked havoc in the country. Loyangapo says the China government has also supported the victims by giving them food items. He assured the residents that through the cross-border initiative, the government has invested 250 million shillings to construct a dam in a sub-court north sub-county so as to better the lives of people living in the county. We have a multi-agency team that we send them today to finalize on some issues we want to clarify. How many people now are affected, we know. How many need houses to be rebuilt, we know. How many schools, and so on and so on. We have come up with a rough design of a house that is going to assist them to just settle. The area governor says the multi-agency committee has settled on constructing a two-roomed house with a side kitchen and toilet, which will cost 35 million shillings. Lunyangapo has noted that they know that the total number of people who deserve the houses. He added that six schools were destroyed and require 5 million shillings per school for renovation. Nice. All right, now small-scale farmers who harvested their produce as early as October are getting impatient with the closure of National Cereals and Produce Board, that is NCPB, stores. According to the farmers, most of them have been prompted to sell their produce to millers and traders to meet their financial needs. Some small-scale farmers harvested produce as early as October, while some large-scale producers are still harvesting after heavy rains interrupted mechanized operations because tractors could not move in the farms. According to the farmers, most of them have been prompted to sell to millers and traders to meet their financial needs. They say that failure by the government through Strategic Grain Reserve Oversight Board to set producer prices for the current season has led to exploitation of farmers who are sold immediately to curb post-harvest losses as a result of high humid conditions. However, the farmers are getting impatient with the closure of national cereals and produce board stores. They have noted that NCPB stores are normally opened around November, but it seems that the government will not buy maize from them this season. They decry that the government has failed to announce maize producer prices to stabilize the market. They say this leads to millers and traders buying the maize at the prices they wish, thus exploiting them. Earlier on, farmers had met the SFR board and gave out recommendations that produce be bought at 3,600 shillings per 90 kg bag and are awaiting a response from the government. The SFR recently pointed a finger at NCPB saying it should produce proceeds from sales of stock to facilitate purchase of new stocks for farmers. During an interview with one of the local dailies, Noah Wekesa, the SFR board chairman, noted that the board will start purchasing maize from the farmers as soon as NCPB channels 11 billion shillings from sale of old stock to account, citing that further delays will affect their work as a board and also frustrate small farmers.
However, sources revealed that NCPB is awaiting instructions from the government on when to start purchasing the maize from farmers, adding that the board is ready to receive supplies from the farmers. Oh. Farmers are also urged to utilize drain services in NCPB stores to curb post-harvest losses, and those who wish to store grains for future sale can also store in respective NCPB stores across the country. Jerry Jogu for ABC TV. And across the borders now, U.S. President Donald Trump was assured of a place in history this month when the U.S. House of Representatives voted to impeach him over his efforts to pressure Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden. Trump is expected to be acquitted in an impeachment trial early next year in the Republican-controlled Senate, but the political fallout from the impeachment drama will be a factor in the 2020 presidential election. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has more from Washington. Please welcome the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump! In times of trouble, President Trump can always count on the warm embrace of his political base. Even as the House voted to impeach him, Trump lashed out at Democrats at a rally in Michigan. You are the ones interfering in America's elections. You are the ones subverting America's democracy. We did nothing wrong, nothing whatsoever. This was just an excuse. Article 1 is adopted. House Democrats said they impeached Trump because they could not ignore the president's attempts to enlist Ukraine's help in his re-election bid in 2020. Maryland Congressman Steny Hoyer. This impeachment asks whether we are still a republic of laws, as our founders intended, or whether we will accept that one person can be above the law. The president's chances of surviving impeachment are much brighter in the Senate, where Republicans are poised to acquit him in a trial, including okay. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. This particular House of Representatives has let its partisan rage at this particular president create a toxic new precedent that will echo well into the future. North Senate Congress Democratic leader Chuck pleasure. Schumer said his party Mr. will president. press the case. I have little doubt that if we tell the president that he can escape scrutiny in this instance, he will do it again and again and again. Democrats and Republicans expect impeachment to be a factor in next year's presidential election, says Julie Pace. It's just a huge unknown. Both parties think that this could play to their favor, and privately both parties think it could work against them. But we just haven't been in this situation before where you have an impeachment and then that impeached president running for re-election. The impeachment saga has consumed Washington in recent months. But voters have short memories, warns University of Virginia expert Larry Sabato. This is going to be much less significant by next November than people think. It's going to seem like an eon past. And that means other controversies, other issues, uh, the two candidates, Democrat and Republican, will dominate the election, not impeachment. Public opinion polls show the country remains sharply divided on impeachment. And the lengthy process in the House did little to alter that dynamic, says analyst Capri Cafaro. But I think what's happened with impeachment is that it really hasn't had any significant impact in changing minds. I think it has solidified the camp. The Senate will take up the issue of Trump's fitness for office in January. But the ultimate verdict is expected to be rendered by U.S. voters in the election next November. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. All right, now time for us to take another very short breather, but when we come back, we'll tell you what's happening in the sporting world. Now, national volleyball team Malkia strikers are expected to jet out of the country in January 2nd, 2020, ahead of their crunch Tokyo Olympics qualifiers games in Cameroon. Davis Maria with more on that story. 
Malkia strikers who have been in the camp for over a month will be aiming to kickstart 2020 with the brighter flames when they head to Cameroon, their hunt of the Tokyo Olympics qualifier games. So basically we are training on uh, our weak points as a Kenyan team. We are training on reception and the net defense and backward defense. The squad comprises largely of KCB technical squad and playing unit. KCB ladies volleyball team technical advisor Paul Bitok will be deputized by Jafet Munala. In the squad we have the, the first appraising the most in the the best attacker in the country. We have uh, in the last year's club championship. Uh, Darren Chuk. We want to rely on half uh, for demolishing the Cameroon team. But the Cameroon is the most threat so far, despite apart from Egypt and uh, Tunisia. So mostly when we go outside there, what disturbs us or what is the back for us most is the reception. Uh, of course not that much, but reception, blocks and services from the opening teams. So I think what we are working on, we are working on our defense, working on our reception, we are working on our services. KCB captain Noel Murambi will skip the team alongside backside Agala. She'll be joined by the teammates Lindsay Geruto, Valet Makuto, Leonida Kasaya and Jemai Masiangu. We have a we also have experienced players. We have Noel Murambi, KCB, we have Noel, the captain. We have uh, Valet Makuto, KCB and we have uh, Leonida Kasaya, KCB and Eddie Pisa, results. And the set of, of course, our experience. So we are relying on this to make us through to Japan. I understand the change here, but the team is just okay because I've come with a positive energy, meaning everything will be okay. Sana sana tuna shikili ya kore because we end up on the road. We want to perfect the situation so that we can tukio kumbele to school and that's why we are working on the meeting. We have like a man in the camp and I think it will really help us because we're bonding together for that next time. It will really help us to, to, to gel. Violet Makuto and Noel Murambi have been instrumental in the guiding the national team to major victories in Mexico, Puerto Rico and Japan for the last seven years. Makuto inspired Kenya to a 3-1 convincing win over Cameroon in Osaka during the 2019 Volleyball Women's World Cup. <laughs> Davis Mberia, Ebru Sports. And elsewhere, the Kenya Premier League battle this season is getting tough after each round. KCB Football Club will be keen on maintaining positive results during the second leg of 2019-2020 Kenya Premier League campaign. The bankers have won seven games, drawn four and lost two so far, amassing 25 points. And the team has been boosted by return of form in recent times. The team is now fifth on the log. The team is looking to reinforce its attack and to a look to higher conversion of chances created according to tactician Godfrey Odo. The team thumbed Wazito 2-1 over the weekend in Machakos with the goals by Enoch Agwanda and Simon Munala. So far, the team has netted 21 goals, 10 of them coming against Karyubangi Sharks and Poster Rangers in two successive weeks of the excellent form. Enoch Agwanda is the top scorer with eight goals while Regan Otieno and Simon Abuko have scored three and two goals apiece. The bankers will kick off the second leg of the season with the clashes against Mathari United on January 4th at Kasarani Stadium, followed by clashes against Sofa Parker and Chemlal to follow. <laughs> Davis Mberia, Ebru Sports. All right, and on that note, we conclude Ebru TV Primetime News. Thank you so much for staying with us. My name is Winnie Lubembe on behalf of an amazing, amazing team who put together this bulletin from our reporters to a very, very big team behind us who you don't get to see every so often. Uh, we want to wish you a merry, merry Christmas with your friends and family. Have a good time 
make merry, celebrate. But once again, remember, it's all about balance. So you do not want to overdo on one thing and less on the other. You need to balance because come January, that is the year 2020, we do not want anyone to start complaining about January. All right. So have yourselves a Merry Christmas. Good night. God bless. We'll see you again some other time on Every TV Primetime News. But for now, it's a goodbye.